What if you could help others to find the power to heal themselves, physically, emotionally, and spiritually? When I started teaching my classes, it was in 2002, and I was just doing the past life regressions and contacting the subconscious part. But then as the time went on and we found how powerful this was and what we could do with it, a lot of the students began saying, you know, advanced past life regression doesn't really tell what it's all about. This is so much more than that. We think you should change the name. So it was a few years ago, we decided to change the name to Quantum Healing Hypnosis Technique. And this is the healing technique that we've now been teaching it, well, since 2002, that's 12 years. What if you could time travel with them? Visit mythical places or angelic realms, other worlds, other galaxies. Help others to speak to their higher selves. You can. Dolores has taught thousands of people from across the world how to use QHHT and now you can learn her method by going directly to DoloresCannon.com and don't forget to mention the discount code MORETALKS. The More Show is supported by Mindscape, Paranormal and UFO Matrix magazines. Available for download on all major digital platforms. Established over 100 years ago, Watkins Books is one of the world's oldest and leading independent bookshops specializing in esoterica. We have the widest selection of esoteric books in the UK, and our friendly and knowledgeable staff are here to assist you in a unique ambience of our shop. So come and visit us in the heart of London as we're open every day. The comments and views expressed on The More Show are those of the people that make them and do not necessarily reflect the view of Kevin Moore, The More Show, or this radio station and its affiliate or sponsors. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Broadcasting from the UK and across the world online, you're now watching the UK's only alternative late night talk show. And I'm your host, Kevin Moore. For the next hour, I'll be covering subjects that will open up your mind and provide you with information you may have never heard before. On today's show, I'm joined with Brooks Agnew, who grew up in California around JPL and Caltech. Now, he received his bachelor's in chemistry from Tennessee Technology University with honors. His favorite hobby is being the host of X Squared Radio, which explores the mysteries of the universe and of the Earth each Sunday evening. Now he's also a multi-patented engineer and currently the CEO of an automobile manufacturing company in North Carolina, producing the nation's first affordable electric pickup truck. Well, Dr. Brooke Agnew, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you very much. It's good to be here. It's fantastic and an honor and it's great to have you on. <laughs> um, I, I was saying off air there just how varied your work is. Would you agree with that? Um, yeah, life has been a roller coaster for me, and I've I've enjoyed it. I I stop at uh, every way station and learn everything I can. You really, really do. Uh, you you know, uh, it's almost like you do a PhD on it. Do you know what I mean? Well, yeah. Except the PhD, you know a lot about a very little, one little teeny tiny microscopic point you're, you're an expert at. So I decided early on in life to just read everything I could and try to tie everything together and at some point halfway through my life it became just too fascinating so I started doing it full time and I've been lucky enough to have the facilities to be able to recall it and put it together and explain it to other people and and here we are. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, how, w where did your interest for all this start in, in, in the sort of um, alternative field? If 
I'll use that word alternative field. Yep, just for now. Where did that start for that, you? That's a really good question because you know I'm I'm I've been a classic scientist my whole life up until my early fifties. Uh, you know, I was an engineer, worked in the automotive industry, manufactured things and, and built machines and processes and solved problems, just like every engineer does. And then uh, I went to a conference to speak about the first book that we had written called The Arc of Millions of Years, Volume 1, which uh, was turned into a four-book series. But uh, I will say, Mr. Moore, that I woke up during that uh, expo. I... I kind of remembered who I was, let me put it that way. And I just made a determination at that point in my life, I was never going back to sleep. So I started listening to all kinds of alternative media, reading alternative science. Of course, I could find a lot of flaws in a lot of the science, but some of it made some sense. Some of it really asked legitimate scientific questions for which we don't really have a legitimate scientific answer which makes scientists very curious and really uh, that's our that's our our oatmeal that's that's what really gives us energy and gets us going so as i began searching for the answers actually doing experiments or reading about experiments or causing experiments to be done to prove or disprove these theories in a lot of cases we could not disprove them and so that that becomes very legitimate fodder for building more complex associations we call them transitory relationships where we make the jump from say geology to cosmology or from cosmology to astrology or uh, for instance in the book that you have there remembering the future in in teaching college algebra i had a bunch of adults in in my class and i didn't want to teach the section on fibonacci and just breeze through it because no one would ever use it again. They they would remember it for the test and that would be it. So I tried to make it interesting for them. And in doing that, I, I just took two random numbers and added them together. And I just started as though that was the beginning of my Fibonacci sequence. And by the time I got out eight iterations, when you divide one, the seventh number into the eighth number, you got 1.618. Mm. And I said, well, that's just, that's a coincidence. So I took two other numbers and then I took imaginary numbers and then uh, formulas and and functions and it worked every single time. So I said if, if, it, if it's a mathematical truism that if you start on this additive process, by the time you get to eight operations, you're on the golden mean. You now have what in nature we call a creative process. Once you're on that golden mean of 1.618 to 1, you have something that begins to resonate something that begins to build value or build energy or build strength. So I coupled that with the assumption, as I told you, these transitory relationships, that human consciousness is actually an energy input into a given set or environment. So if I could take sequences of addition by human consciousness and do it eight times, I should be able to build that same resonance. And that's exactly what happened. And things began to manifest in reality that didn't exist before. It's really solid things. And then I realized that we have been given notes about our future. We get them from prophets. We get them in scriptures. We get them in people that can actually see the future. And Unfortunately, we've kind of accepted that future. We've read the Bible and we've said, oh, this is what's going to happen. We're all going to fight in Armageddon and we're going to be destroyed and the wicked are going to be burned as stubble and Jesus is going to come down and split them out of olives and take the righteous up into heaven. That's what's going to happen. So I need to make my decision which side I'm going to be on because I don't want to burn. I'd rather go up to heaven, right? That's that's the shtick. So I said, if that's the future that we've been shown and I accept the premise that prophecy exists and that prophecies are conditional predictions. This is what's going to happen if you keep doing that. This is what's going to happen if you don't stop doing that. Well, we know that future. We've read that future. and I kind of don't like that future. No. So I choose another one. I choose another future. Let's build something else. We have the creative ability to do it. We've been shown the mathematical function now for doing it. So let's make the laws of the universe work for what we want. Let's become co-creators. 
instead of passengers. And 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 how okay so so really in a lot of your work then you've you know it'll would you say a lot of it's coming down to the word consciousness does that come into your work quite a bit? <clears throat> well, you know who Sir Roger Penrose is who who doesn't? Uh, brilliant man, obviously highly accomplished and and not only a great theoretical physicist but a great speaker and a great presenter and believe me, half of physics is physics and the other half is presentation and he was great at both of that. But he made a statement I disagreed with him once on, and that is that quantum or consciousness is the result of quantum gravity. And I gave that some thought, and I wrote back to him and said, actually, uh, Dr. Penrose, I think you have that backwards. I think quantum gravity is the result of consciousness. And now we're both thinking about it. So it, it does come down to consciousness as a causative agent in all of mathematics and all of physics and all of creation. When we look at the set of energy that's in the universe, we realize, at least we assume now, based upon what we can observe in the third dimension, that only about 5% of the universe is in the third dimension. The rest of it is in some other dimension, but it perturbs this dimension. So we have 5% of the universe we can see and 95% of the universe that we cannot see we call it dark matter or dark energy. It could be it could be super bright matter for all we know. We just can't see it, so we call it dark. But occasionally that energy resonates in that 1.618 to 1 ratio and pops into this dimension. It becomes physical. It leaves whatever dimensions it in, two to, to twenty-six, and enters the third dimension where we can behold it. And then it, it stays here for well, virtually for what we call forever. And all we really need is the consciousness to help that energy move from that dimension into this dimension. And that is the, the core of manifestation. Is, is that the dimension that we've come from? It, 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 could there be un, infinitive dimensions? We, we mentioned one to a specific number there, but could there be infinitive? And is that where consciousness comes from, this this these other dimensions in a, in a sense that we, we weren't, the, 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 our consciousness as we call it, this awareness of I am, you know, didn't just come from the womb. It was, it came from somewhere else to have an experience here potentially. It's, it's a legitimate question, but it's, it's a matter of terms. Um, I once said that the secret to life is clean glassware and conversion factors. <laughs> so if we can get our terms right, I think we can understand this. Yeah. A lot of people use the term dimensions but they really mean or think about universes. So in the sense that there are an infinite number of universes, that's probably true. It is improper to say a universe can be infinite because, of course, it can't. We, we have a finite measuring system all the way down to the Planck length, and, and that's it. That's as small as we can get. That, the fact that that's as small as we can get means we have a finite universe. But it also means there may be infinite numbers of universes. Inside those universes, there are several dimensions that operate. And we can extrapolate that out to about 26 dimensions. And some of them are kind of esoteric. They're rotational dimensions instead of actual dimensions in which something can exist. It exists in a certain vibrational or spin state, and we call that a dimension. But that's inside of a universe. Think of it like universe being a book, and there's 26 chapters in the book. We, we, I mean, look, I mean, this, this really, this, there's no point asking this question. Really, <laughs> we don't know. But would you be surprised if there, if there was something beyond that, that's beyond our understanding? No, I wouldn't be surprised at that at all. I think the uh, one of the things that we have as beings here on this planet is perspective. We have the ability to perceive time, which no other animal, not, I don't even think uh, dolphins or whales understand the concept of time, but we do. And we can, because of our uh, conscious ability, because of our connection to soul, we can disconnect ourselves from now and we can perceive the past and the future, either one or, or both at the same time. And the fact that we can observe it seriously with our consciousness means we can change it. Now, the past is not as changeable as the future, 
because it's already happened and we already laid down our mark. But it is, you can go back and affect it. You can go back and affect how you're affected by the past, which changes the present, and thus its future course. But you can definitely change the future. I call it the potential of all potentialities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now it's, yes, crisscrossed up by everyone else's intention too, and that's why I say the reality that we perceive, this average reality here on Earth, is actually the the average or the distribution of all the consciousnesses in it yes so obviously we have a very large energy set now on the earth with seven billion people alive on the earth now i will offer this disclaimer that the vast majority of those seven billion people are not conscious that they're conscious that's right but that consciousness still affects the mean reality of what we see as Earth. So we know, statistically speaking, with very large populations, it's hard to get the mean or the average to shift. It means you have to change the mind or activate a large volume of the population in order to get a, a statistically significant shift in that. Um, we know that we have tail conditions that can affect the, the whole population, but that's very random. It's a very, very, very small percentage. What we really want to do is change the average appearance of the universe. And I, I use that word literally. The universe is an appearance of reality. Uh, I call it, in the book, I call it the photon moment. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ed Close and I were having a discussion and uh, when we finished the discussion of everything he had written, it left a question in my mind. And I asked him, so, so from the perspective of the photon, our photon, you claim there's no path. Uh, the photon leaves Arcturus and arrives at Earth exactly at the same moment because time collapses. And I think that's legitimate if you look at the mathematics of it, but the other, the inverse of that, because it's on the other side of the equation, is mass goes to infinity, which means that the Big Bang never happened. The whole universe is still the singularity it originally was. The actual expansion of the universe is an appearance. It's a perspective, and it's our consciousness that created that perspective. So it's... It's our consciousness that slowed everything down so that we could see time as distance. Wow. Wow. Absolutely. That's just a, yeah, that, that's rather fascinating what you're saying there. You know, I, I had the crazy thought that came to me uh, yesterday. I was walking home uh, from the gym of all places and I was like, well, what if this experience I'm having right now is one of my life reviews? What, what if this isn't what I even think it is? What if I've had the chance to come back and, and correct something that, I, that, I've, uh, that, that didn't go as well for me as it could have done? What if this isn't life as it truly is? This is something else, even though it feels very real. <laughs> and I was, you know, when you ask these kind of questions, it doesn't really help you in the present moment. Right? But it, but it was well, just a crazy it, thought. No, it's, it's really it's really a good thought, and it's a good reflection process. More people need to do that. Here's what really happens when you when you have a moment like that. You're you're beginning to question what you have been taught as a paradigm, and that is that that there is a now. There's a now. I mean, there, that just went by, so that's then. But this is now. And a lot of people say the, the only place you really exist is now. But from a physics point of view, when we look at this thing and we try to determine, say, speed or rotation or location or something, there's no now. If there was a now, we couldn't tell how fast it goes to the universe. We couldn't locate it. So now is just a lens. It's just a keyhole that we look through. The, the whole other existence, past and future, also coexist. Because what it means, let's say you are considering, oh man, when I was in the sixth grade, I took, uh, I took uh, world history and, and world uh, global economics. And I sucked at it. I got an F in it. Well, it didn't affect the whole rest of your life, leaving you with a dunce cap on your head. Later in life, you went back and you learned all those things you didn't learn in the sixth grade. So... You healed it. You went back there. You changed that script that was written on you in the sixth grade, and you came to the future. Now, 
In reality, what you really did is you went back to the sixth grade and you changed your grade from an F to an A. Because now, which is the future to that past, that script has been repaired. You cleared it. It's gone. So now you can move in another direction instead of not knowing anything about world history and global economics. And that's yeah. what we do. Yeah. But we can also do that in the future. Yeah. I have a, a, a cartoon in the book. It's a Dilbert cartoon. And Dilbert says to himself, in the future, I perceive that I pick the soup and not the salad. <laughs> so if I choose the that's salad right. instead, yeah. mm -hmm. does mm -hmm. that mean that my... View, my memory of the future is wrong? Mm. No, it doesn't. Mm. It means that with that knowledge that you brought back from the future, mm. you, can, you are now empowered to make a better decision. Yeah. It, yeah, yeah. It's almost like, I mean, I, I hope we're remaining on your book here. I mean, I, I want to get... I'm gonna, I've got so many questions about, about the book to ask you, but it's so fascinating, the line that, of questioning that we've taken together. Um, you know, it's almost like there is no wrongs. That you, well, they're, they're, well, they're fit, they're, well, I wouldn't want to knowingly hurt someone. That would be wrong to me in a sense. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do that. My consciousness would say no. But it, it, what I mean by there's no wrong is that whatever decision we make, whether we marry that person or we don't, or we take that job or we don't, or we move away or stay here or we don't, there is no wrong because, in a sense, maybe we get the chance to relive it either way. I agree with that in the sense that, you know, we don't really want a victim to our past because yes. that would be hard to fix. You know, yes. I, I can't can't bring the, the finger I cut off back. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so in that sense, we, we want that 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 right or wrong to be victimless and, and that's a great desire that most of us have and I think the more conscious you are the more aware you are that we are connected with one another and that so your true. your uh, will is to protect the will of others as well you don't no. want to dominate others no. some people are not very uh, not very conscious and so they <laughs> dominate others and, and, and don't have any any uh, regrets over that but I, I totally get what you're saying so yes that's exactly right that you can go back and you can live these past events over and over again until you get them right now that also raises the question about the eternality of the soul right uh, you know I, I give a lecture on this and I in the lecture show my high school graduation picture next to a picture of me when I'm 52 years old hold on a second Um, to me, these two pictures are 15 minutes apart. I love it. Yeah, absolutely. In, you know, in reality, you know, 25 <laughs> years went by or 45 mm. years went by. Mm. But mm. Mm. I, I was interviewing a, a, a woman who was, I think she was 104 years old. Wow. And I asked her, you know, to what do you attribute your long life? And I, I whatever she told me was inconsequential. I don't remember it. But I, I did say... If you had your life to live over again, and it's long, I mean, you lived over a century, is there anything that you missed or that you would go back and do? And she said, yeah, I, w I would learn, learn to dance. I never learned to dance. And I thought, wow, you know, I mean, there, there's a lot of things I want to learn to do. So while I'm physically able, I'm going to do it and learn to dance, scuba dive, fly airplanes, parachute, whatever it mm -hmm. is, I'm going to learn how to do it if I want to do it. Mm -hmm. And I was inspired by this woman, really, really. Good. But then I said, so if you had to rate your life, you know, was it a good life? And she said, well, it, it, it had its moments. But if I had it to do over again, that is all I would have is moments one after the other. And that stuck out. That really hit me like a ton of bricks. I mean, I thought, you know, the moment is a perspective of time that we perceive. Sometimes it's just a second and sometimes it's an hour. Sometimes we think five minutes takes an hour, like we're waiting for class to get out and that clock just won't move. Other times we're having a great time with friends and time goes by so fast we realize it's four o'clock in the morning and the bar should mm. close any minute. <laughs> but uh, it... it that's our perspective is moments. Yeah, moments so that's yeah. that's what i determined to have is just moments one after the other and i really don't want any time in between them 
I suppose some people feel, and I could be maybe one of these, maybe sometimes that you know, I you know, I wouldn't want to come back again. Um, uh, it, you know, it, it's it's been difficult. It's not been easy. Uh, there's moments, more moments than those that I feel. No, actually, life is so precious. You chose to come here. You, you I, I think you chose to come here. And if that's the case, which I think it is, if I feel that it is. This must be so so important. Life is then so precious that 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 it comes to let's make it count. Let's make it count. Um, Very powerful. Mm. Very powerful. You know, I sometimes uh, people say, "Ah, oh, man, I've ordered enough of this. I'm take me anytime. I'm ready to go. Just anytime I'm ready to go. I hate it here." And I realize that I've been there too in my life. But I realize that those moments and in there, those moments in those lives. They're trapped in the solids. They're trapped in scarcity somehow. And once you can disconnect from that, once you can say this, the solids are inconsequential, really what it is I'm trying to learn, what I'm trying to do is important. I did this in the book. I described the difference between heaven and hell. Only I didn't describe it as that. I interviewed people and I said, so I'm going to send you to a place where you really don't have to do anything. You're fed three times a day. You have a nice, warm, safe place to sleep. There's no kind of conflict. There are no mountains you can see as far as you want to see. There's never any bad weather. Uh, you don't have to worry about money because everything is taken care of. And you also have all knowledge. You don't have to learn anything. You don't have to go to school for anything. You already have all the knowledge. And they go, I don't really like that description. That, that doesn't sound good to me. Well, I just described heaven to you, and now you're saying you're not really wanting to go there. Let me describe another place to you. Uh, it can sometimes be very harsh, and also your knowledge is limited, but you can learn anything you want to learn. There are mountains to climb and oceans to cross, and there are caves to explore, and there's more life forms than you could ever learn in a hundred lifetimes on this planet. But it's, it's not always easy. In fact, sometimes it's, it's pretty darn hard. And they go, yeah, yeah, that's the place I want to go. Well, that's Earth, baby. And I look at the souls that have come here for their mortal life. Jesus, Lincoln, I mean, Gandhi, the greatest souls in the entire universe mm. came here to have a mortal life. Mm. So I feel very privileged that I'm here. And I consider Earth to be a type of heaven. And I'm going to meet every challenge. Not going to pass them all, but I'm going to give it my best. No, that's really inspiring. Thank, thank you for sharing this with the audience. It's re really, really inspiring what you're saying here. Absolutely. And I'll just, I mean, I'll just go back to something you've said as well. We could speak here all day. <laughs> Fifty-one minutes is going to fly by. What you said about the con that consciousness as well. You know, I mean, when, when, as I'm looking around the room now, and I'm able to perceive all these things with my eyes and i know it's my brain uh you know uh, that, that that's we, we, uh, 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 i can't think of the word it, you know it's not converting but it's decoding sorry that's the word decoding you know the 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 uh, around me but there's something more than that because i'm aware of me i'm aware of i am i'm aware but yet i know what it's like to fall asleep where they you have those or, or to be put on uh, under anesthetic um you know where you just go out and there's nothing and it's almost like well that's maybe what the soul wants to perceive is blackness to have that experience when you do go out like that but actually there is something there you just you know, you're not you've not crossed over to re remember that just yet or i'm tricking myself in that belief but i but put all that to the side it still comes to what i said to begin with that it's that awareness of i am where does i don't think the brain's able surely the brain can't be able to do that it's just it's it seems this it seems so much bigger than the brain this this i am awareness that we all have well i've come to believe at least scientifically physiologically that the brain the actual organ the gray matter of the brain and the heart are actually are are just lenses it's a lens through which we can perceive the physical reality around us. The mind is something completely different. It is something driven by the soul. It's a, it's a combination of understandings and perceptions and, and preconceptions, some of which we have to overcome. And it, 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 it is difficult, I guess, sometimes to have a good brain. You, are, you inherit those cells, but we wire it ourselves. I know this because um, I interviewed a lot of twins for this book, Remembering the Future. 
And the twins that I, and I interviewed, some of them were teenagers. Most of them were on up in years, 40, 50, 60 years old. And what I realized, even identical twins, when they're born, they're genetically the same. By the time they hit puberty, slight, very slight changes mm -hmm. to each other. But mm -hmm. their physical surroundings were all the same. They ate the same thing. They wore the same thing. They lived in the same house. They went to the same school, uh, same parents. And yet, later in life, they diverge physiologically quite dramatically. And so I thought to myself, I was actually talking with um, Dr. Bruce Lipton. He was had just finished his first book. And we were having this interview, and I got to the end of where he'd stopped in his book, and I said, but Bruce, how does the cell, you know, a cell dies? And so a, a cell is now going to divide, and it's going to replace the cell that died. How does it know to be a skin cell or a bone or a, or a blood cell? How does it know that? He said, well, it takes the information from the cell right next door to it. I said, well, okay, I'm going to push this question just a little bit. Let's just say one of two things. Either that cell's right next to another cell, like it's eye tissue or it's the muscle attached to the eye. It's like that one cell. How does it pick eye or muscle to replace? That's a good question. Yeah. And the other question is, what if there are only two cells, sperm and egg? How do we know what to become? And he said, well, I didn't put this in the book, but here's the truth of the matter. There's an electromagnetic image of what those physical cells are supposed to be. And so when the cells begin to divide, they just fill in the electromagnetic image. I said, Bruce, you need to put that in the book. That's a really, really important point. So when it comes to the physical manifestation... It's the soul, it's the being, the leaping, flying gazelle inside the physical body that affects the environment of each and every cell in that body. People with good attitudes, with future views, and they, they, they're healthier. They live longer. Their bodies work better. Who chooses the shape of our body? We do. You did by going to the gym the other day, by what you eat or don't eat, by how much you sleep. You can abuse the crap out of your body and weigh 300 pounds, or you can shape it and, and mold it the way you want to move, well, almost the way you want to move, here on this planet. And so it's, it's largely up to us how that brain works. Because some people could read something one time and remember it and then go recall it. Other people have to read it four times and then think about it in order to to get it to recall but it does take work and i'm just saying if you want to win the lottery buy a ticket <laughs> absolutely and, and and going back to thank you for that by the way and going back to um well actually before we move on from that i suppose <laughs> there, there, there there is no real answer to, to consciousness in a sense except for what we've well, that's a great answer, but you know, is it is it my defining answer for me? Oh God, it's so difficult. It's a great answer, it is, uh, Brooks. But um, I'm, I, I think it'll be something I struggle with to the end to, to, until I cross over. <laughs> well, then then what happens? Well, yeah, exactly. Then what reality am I going to create? <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. that's a really good question. I mean, maybe yeah. you know, while we're sleeping, we don't really we don't really feel pain. Can't stub our toe. And I will tell you, my uh, my coach told me at a very young age, pain is the best teacher there is. Oh yes, so, uh, <laughs> oh, yes, 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 yes. That's so true. So while, you know, while we're in the out of the body state or we're ethereal, I would think we don't learn very much. Lots and lots of distance, lots of time goes by. We don't learn very much at all. This is a very, very concentrated, compressed uh, school. And in less than 100 years, for most of us, we're going to learn enough to fundamentally really change our soul, mm. depending on what comes out of our mouth, not so much what goes into it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, absolutely, and and just just going back to to the book as well. When I've been scanning around the book, you know, we, we, you did touch on this a number of times, and I sort of pulled away from it. That manifestation of your future, in a sense, what is the best way to, for us to manifest um, the life that we desire? It, you know, is it to 
to you to concentrate on that life and, 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 and pull it towards us in a sense, even if we just sat down quietly and really imagined and felt what that the future life is that we were really desired? Well, I mean, that's, that's scratching the surface. It's called the law of attraction. You can, uh, and and I, I did it. I got the magazine and the scissors and I cut the pictures out and I, I turned my refrigerator into a, an intention machine. But that isn't all there is to it. You can't, the first thing you have to do is get a clear vision of what your future needs to look like. Like I ask people, what's your dream? And women usually say, oh, I want to marry a rich man and have a big house. So then when that happens, what, your life is complete and you can die? And they don't really think about that. Most people will pick solids if you ask them what's your dream. But I really want people, when I'm teaching them, X that out. Let's talk about being and doing. What do you want to be and what do you want to do? Let's forget about what you want to have. That, that will come. In fact, if you, even if you have it all, you're not happy. It's the being and the doing that really gives you the satisfaction in life. It's the path. Like when you go to the beach and you take a bucket and your shovel and you're going to build something. Let's call it a sandcastle. When you finish the sandcastle, then what do you do? Jump on it or watch the waves take it away or just walk away from it. it that's not the reason you went to the beach to finish a sandcastle. You went to the beach to build a sandcastle. So the Buddha says that once you step on the path toward your goal, you're already at your goal. I mean, physically, you might be in the past of it, but eventually you're going to be there, and then you're going to think back about all those steps. So once you step on it, you're on the path. So I tell people, if you want to you know, be a lawyer, go to college, get your first degree, and go to law school, finish law school, and pass the bar exam. It takes about seven years, eight years to do all that. But that's a short eight years. I'm telling you, that eight years will go by before you know it. You will find yourself 27 years old and a lawyer. And then you are what you dreamed to be. This is, this is the manifestation. Those kind of pathways we understand pretty clearly because they've been mapped out and followed bunches of times. But if you want to dream of something that's never been done before, there's no path toward it. This is where the real challenge of life comes in. And once you've thought of something that's never been done before and built it and proved to someone that it works, man, it becomes old hat. I mean, you become so good at it that you can literally think of anything that's, that's physically possible and build it and make it happen. So this is the first step is you must have a clear vision of what that future looks like. Then, once you formulate that, you put your energy on it. I call it uh, striking the bell out there in the future. But where most people make the mistake is they hit the bell over and over and over and over again, or, or better yet, they hold on to the bell with one hand and hit it with the other hand, and they can't figure out why their dream doesn't happen. It's because once you put that energy out there in the future, it begins to make its own sound throughout time. Now, when that sound goes out in the universe other things begin to sympathetically vibrate with that sound. I found the key in order to make this eight iteration thing that I'm telling you about work. you got to look for the things that are vibrating with the sound that you put out of there in the future. And then you put the energy into that. And what will happen is that will then sympathetically resonate back to the future and make your dream begin to coalesce. So that's where you put your energy. It, so it might be an email. It might be a job interview. It might be an interview on a radio program. Gee, I want to get this movie produced. But I got an interview with this guy named Moore in the UK. And I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't do it. No, no, no. Do it. Because the producer that you're looking for is listening to his program. That's what I'm talking about. You must put the energy into every single thing that resonates with your idea. And, and this, I, absolutely, yeah. And this idea that, you know, it could have been done by someone, you know, you, it may already have been done before, but you may, you're going to do it your way in a sense. I mean, it's not going to be exactly the same path, but I mean, it might not be something completely new. It'll be new to you. It's like buying a used car. It's not brand new, but it's new to you. 
and it's uh, it's an exciting purchase for you, for you, and you enjoy it. So maybe there's nothing new under the sun, but I guarantee you there's plenty of stuff, plenty of stuff that's used that hasn't been done before in this reality. Uh, uh, yes, yes. So, so sometimes we think, well, why didn't I think of that idea? But, you know, someone else has already thought of it. But actually, uh, there's so, like you say, there's so many ways to, you know, to, to, to do things. And there are lots and lots of untapped um, potential out there for, for new ideas. And, and really, I think those ideas come from just being yourself and living your joy and passion. Where do ideas come from? That's another really great question. Um, you know, I was uh, listening to an interview of... Uh, Michael Jackson and it was like two o'clock in the morning and they had just finished writing the melody to a song that they were going to work on and so it's two o'clock in the morning Michael calls up his lawyer and says we need to copyright this song he says Michael it's it's two o'clock in the morning can't get this wait you know until tomorrow he said no because if we don't copyright this now Prince will have it because all these ideas come from this maelstrom of energy that's pouring out on everybody. Everybody hears that energy based upon their own aptitude. Songwriters, artists, engineers, sculptors, politicians, mathematicians, we all hear it based upon our own aptitude. I was proven this when I was traveling in Tibet. And I was, um, it was not really official travel, okay? I wasn't really in Tibet. Anyway, I went to Tibet, and I'm in the bottom of the Patala. Patala, for a, up till about 150 years ago, was the tallest building in the world. In the basement of the Patala was this huge structure. It must have been 30 feet high, and it, it, I think the ceiling was about 40 feet high. It was immensely huge. And I asked my guide, what, what is this thing here? He said, it's a stupa. A stupa is where you intern the soul of a Panchen Lama so his soul can go through the four-dimensional stargate, you know, to, to heaven. Well, this thing was enormous. It was made of uh, 10, let's see, uh, about 4,000 pounds of gold. And then it had over 10,000 gems on it. And it was exactly like a Tesla coil, <laughs> except it was built in the 7th century. So I said, Punsula... You may call this a stupa, but in the States, we call this a Tesla coil. So I took a picture of it, and I did get it out of Tibet, even though they went through all my pictures. They didn't <laughs> find this one. And I got back, and I, I matched it up with the Tesla coil. And I do it in my presentation that I make for Remembering the Future. You actually line them up with another, and there's all the coils. There are these gold wings coming out of it with ribbons wrapped around it uh, as a symbol of the electricity coming from it. But here's the thing. The Tibetans gave birth to Tibetan Buddhism in the 7th century, and this is what they built. This is what they saw. Tesla builds an enormous coil that, that puts out DC energy as huge sparks of electricity, and it looks exactly the same. It's because the receivers had different aptitudes, and they interpreted that energy in a different way and they created something different with it so does all knowledge already exist in the universe maybe maybe knowledge floats on photons throughout space we get that information we use our aptitude our brain and our past experience and it may be a lot of past experience and we interpret that and create something with it in this dimension mm. the idea the most important thing is to get off the porch and work on it. Yes, and even, you know, you may be floating through life, not be being completely sure what it is you're doing, but at least you're doing something. And that something, right, is actually, as you say, heading towards the bigger picture that you're destined for. You just haven't realized what it is yet. You just haven't tuned in completely because maybe you're supposed to, maybe the path that you're on is the path that you're supposed to be on you you are where you're meant to be acceptance well, in the sense that and and we do this when we're young but as we get older we should be cutting loose from that meant to be stuff um we should not abdicate the responsibility of our own life condition to anyone else no not I, I see a lot of women who, who feel that 
they're crushed and they just can't be, you know, what they, unless they're attached to a man. And I tell them, no, 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 you need to get rid of all that whole idea. Don't abdicate your uh, personality, your personal oh, God, I your see personal it. I God, see that to all a the man. Time. I, yep, yep. You see it all yep. the time. We, uh, and, or to and, a and, teacher or to the state. I uh, mean, my gosh, yeah, look yeah. at all the people that abdicated or, to the state. Or guru or mystic uh, or, or anyone. Or even men to women as well. You know, I, I'm, I can't be on my own and I, you know, I must be with someone, but why is it every relationship I get with is always destructive? Even, you know, I, I'm destructive to it or it's, you know, it, it implodes on me. Well, it's, it goes back to that old adage, you know, I'm going to hook my wagon to your star. You're a star <laughs> and you're going to pull me through space. Sooner or later, <laughs> Mr. Moore, you've got to look around and see all these ropes attached to you. You're dragging wagons by the thousands through space and you got to turn around and cut all those ropes and realize, you know, I'm not looking for another wagon. I'm looking for another star. Absolutely. It depends how much a pain threshold you you can take, I suppose. And uh, We can take a lot. Yes, we can until the mental breakdown happens a couple of times and a few divorces and settlement figures and all sorts of other things happen. Maybe then right. there's, uh, you know, there's, so there's, there's, there's some it spark. It can't kill you. <laughs> no, it can't do You might be on your back on the bottom looking <laughs> yeah. up, but realize this. Yeah, it's there's, absolutely. There's bottom below that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's so true. Um, no, I, I've, but in my life, I've as you have as well, met many people who have, who have gone with their parents passion and I wouldn't you, you can't say everyone's you know it, they may have gone with their passion it's a beautiful thing to see because it's so it's so powerful yet there is always something else lacking in their life I think that goes for anyone you know there's you know um, none of us are perfect we're all on uh, we're all here seemingly to heal in a sense uh, or to or to you know under you know it, there's no judgments. I, I can't. I would never judge anybody. I know I'm not right now. But even that that life that we're pertaining to go to head towards right now, it's it's not without uh, issues. Well, the word perfection itself is uh, maybe mathematically possible, but it's not biologically possible. I love that. Yeah, yeah. The, the word perfect in the scriptures it was really a mistranslation. It should have translated as complete. So when God commands you, he's not commanding you to be perfect. For crying out loud, he knows that's not possible. He says, be therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect, right? Mm -hmm. He's meaning, be therefore complete, mm -hmm. even as your Father, which is in heaven, is complete. Now that says something completely different, not so destructive. Be the complete you, and you are already perfect. Absolutely. What do you think uh, waking up it, the human race looks like, in a sense, an, an awoken person looks like, an awoken human race? What, what would there be less of or more of? Well, I can tell you what there would be less of. There would be less war. Because for some president to tell his generals, I want you to put the army together, we're going to go kill a bunch of those people over there. Eventually, somewhere in that ladder, people are going to go, what? No, 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 no. We're not going to go kill anybody over there. They're over there. We're over here. They're living their life. We're going to live our lives over here. There'd be a lot less war because people would not abdicate the responsibility of their reality to a drill sergeant or to a major or to a general or to a president. That'd be one thing there'd be way less of. The other thing there would be less of is the tendency that animals have to consume everything in the energy set. In other words, uh, we, keep, we would keep priming the pump. We wouldn't go up to the well and drink the glass of water that's supposed to prime the pump so we can pump more water. That's what we tend to do as a race. We go up and we drink the glass of water and then we cry that, hey, how come there's no water? Well, you didn't prime the pump. You're supposed to pour that glass of water into the pump and then you can pump all you want we drink the glass of water or we eat all of our seed we baked it into bread we never saved anything to put in the ground to plant for the next season in other words we believe that we can just keep burning the planet up and it will continuously give us more fossil fuels forever it won't it's a crutch here we are in the 21st century and we are just, maybe just barely learning how to live within the energy set of Earth. We're That's still so living true. beyond it. 
we're still burning millennia of energy that we didn't have anything, any responsibility in creating. That's so so yeah. that's going to run out one day. It, yes, yes, it's, and it's so true what you're saying. Um, you you would you do there is a thread in your books that there is a control system in place in a sense would you say there's some truth in what i'm saying <laughs> it thinks it's in control it <laughs> has it has power uh that it has given itself right in in the books i call it the agency government in the us <laughs> we have agencies departments bureaus and administrations that write law they assess taxes they put fees and fines and police actions and and we have no representation in that government it exists all by itself, and it does its own thing, and yet it consumes everything we produce, and it produces nothing. Yes, nothing. And 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 we are born into that system, uh, even if, as a soul, we choose to come here. Um, we're very much blanked, or there is some veil that's very heavy on us that we don't truly remember our true essence. It's just, it's, it's 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 almost like it doesn't want to be revealed, even if you know it, it, it's almost like it's undefinable, but. We are trying to define this undefinable, almost un untangible, not not wanting to be discovered essence of who we truly are. Because maybe we're meant to be in, you know, this is how it's supposed to be right now. If we just accept how it is, um, you know, we're, we're not having a, a defining moment come to us that this is what it is. Um, but maybe well, it's not that easy to find. Well, it's not. No, it's it's almost like the empirical evidence changes as we look away. Sometimes it's it's. It's almost like it doesn't want to be discovered, which um, consciously not discovered in a sense. So, okay. So we're born into a system where there is control. Now, now the thing is, where did this control come from? Where did this system, can we trace this system back? Would it help us to trace it back? Well, you do speak in your book about the Nephilim, which is many researchers have gone into the Anunnaki as well. Where did the Bible and the religious texts come from? Well, when you look at the clay tablets uh, from Sumerians, uh, you know, there's a lot about Adam and Eve in there, in a sense, or Adam being the first son of the uh, Anunnaki, as in they genetically modified uh, um, um, Homo sapiens. Uh, sorry, genetically modified, um, not Homo sapiens, we became Homo sapiens, didn't we? Um, but the words leave me right now because my tiny in, uh, mind. Maybe primates. The primates, yes, sorry, that's what I'm looking for, sorry. Um, so, so you know, have we? It, was there a controlling factor here that's put religion here that was here for a long time, and hence is the reason why the systems are in place now? They've left now, obviously, but well, I don't think they have. I mean, there were only two hundred of them then. But uh, one thing that they realized early on is that humans breed like rabbits, and uh, you know, once we uh, riot or or decide we're going to throw something out, we're pretty forceful. And that's really not the way to capture souls anyway. The, to capture souls, you have to get them to choose evil. You can't just kill them. Um, I, I believe that the Nephilim are still here. Birth, the, the book that I just finished and I'm working on the sequel to right now, uh, covers the premise that the Nephilim are working deep inside the agencies in some cave or some, you know, NORAD or, or a Site R up in Virginia. And they're the ones giving the power and the answers and the advanced weapons to greedy men who are then, you know, using that to gain control over the world. The, the idea that they are in control is based upon the fact that we have a tendency to abdicate the responsibility of our own care and feeding to someone else. The books are designed to awaken you away from that because once you come away from that, they lose their power over you. They're not able to hold on to you anymore. And yeah, they could probably kill you if they wanted to, but so what? Your soul is uh, going to go on in the right direction that it needs to go. It's not going to be captured in darkness that it just doesn't work that way. It, 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 there's a premise that, you know, there's some being in the universe that says, you go to heaven, you go to hell, you go to heaven, you go to hell. You're making me happy, you go to heaven. You, I don't like, you're going to hell. The reality is that we are the ones individually that choose on a microsecond level whether we are in heaven or in hell. We're the ones that do that. Nobody judges us but ourselves. But do you think that that setup that you described in there was what, 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 is a setup that's still based on religious foundations in a sense that that's ne never how it was? Um, and if 
well, just going back to the Anunnaki, you know, potentially, you know, there are those scholars nowadays who feel that the Anunnaki is, uh, you know, set religion up in a sense, set the many religions up for, for control. This is just my personal opinion, but I think religion is set up primarily to make men fear eternal damnation. Yes, yes, yes. And it's, but it's very attractive, though. It's very addictive. Well, it is when you make people afraid to die. Uh, when you make people afraid to live in a certain way, then uh, and you you present a fear based system that that judges people based on their laws. Politics is just the machine of of religion. That's all it really is. They're both exactly the same. And originally, science and religion were were together. Uh, true principles were mixed with false um, ideas or false. Uh, religions, and then made to trick mankind into allegiance. Sometime in the last couple centuries, we have successfully separated science from religion, but we still have our high priests in the scientific community, believe me, they're called peers, and they review everything that you do and decide whether it's legitimate or not. It doesn't mean that you're not smart anymore, it just means that they don't bless your work. So the religion part of it is still there. I, I think that the concept is universal mm -hmm. to use use a system of fear to control other people. Yes. That is basically religion of any kind. Yes. Well, you know, um, the Anunnaki didn't have a religion. They worked for what they called the one source. Now, there are those scholars that say that potentially there was the good Anunnaki and there was the bad, the good, you know, and it was the bad that, 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 that you know, created this control that, that, that we're, we're currently in right now. But the good, as they came here, was to consciously evolve... Um, life you, you know to genetically sorry engineer life as it was uh, and and to 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 increase um the chances of of this happening of consciousness growing in this in in, in what we are now for it to have for consciousness to be able to come down here to have this experience um did they come to mine gold were we their slaves well uh, we don't know. I mean, I mean, there are there, 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 there's all the, the 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 evidence to say that was the case from what the Sumerians left in the form of these tablets and 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 everything else to, 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 that that documented uh, what they were here for. Who knows? It's it's very interesting, and and I just wanted to to bring that up because I know you you you've, you've mentioned this in your previous work before, but coming back um, to where we are now, I you know I see. I see a great future because, yes, there may be this system that's in place, but the system doesn't stop us from getting like-minded people and groups getting together to discuss the problems of the world and how together we can solve them without government. You know, it's, it's not about, you know, going against the system. It's about creating something new, yes, ourselves. Well, one thing is for sure, uh, this system these power brokers, the ones that uh, uh, tend to create this powers that be category, they're losing control and they're not too happy about it. Uh, but I don't really think there's much they can do about it because humanity has had that I am moment. We've, we've been connected now electronically for what, approximately 20 years, not very long at all. But Tesla correctly predicted that if we could wire the world together like this, you would change, you would evolve the human race. It would become a brain by itself. And in 20 years, That's we've really incredible. seen humanity change. Yeah. And um, what's happening is these, these powers that be, they're losing their grip. The Bilderbergs, they're frustrated. The uh, Trilateral Commission, if that exists, they're frustrated. This uh, League of Foreign Nations or the, the, the organizations in Washington, D.C. that think that they control all the big chess pieces around the world, Guess what? Their moves are not working. The whole financial system is on the verge of total collapse. Everyone is in debt to whom I have no idea. It's like nine uh, card players that sit around a table and play cards. Then all of a sudden they look up and no one can ante up because everyone at the table's broke. What do you mean? One of those players should have one big ass pile of chips, but they don't. They're all broke. See, that just doesn't make any sense to me. That energy, all that money, all that wealth, all that value is still there. It's just not in the game. So it won't take long. 
that's going to collapse and it'll get back in the game. Yeah. Because the real value, Mr. Moore, is right here. Well, there it this, is. <laughs> this is the real value. Get those guns there's, out. <laughs> there's no value in the dollar. That's just a promise to pay for this. <laughs> this. This still exists. I love it. We can still work. We are the value, mm. not the money. Absolutely. And that's my point. And I see the, a, a younger generation coming forward now um, having these discussions through YouTube and the platforms and, and stuff like that. Um, there was a guy, Fun, Fun with Luis. He's a big YouTuber. He's going around the world right now speaking to communities and, and asking them what's wrong with their countries and how they can change it. I'll, I'll link his videos just below this video as well just to show people what I'm talking about. And if he can have those kind of discussions like that with people. And yeah, you can watch him and think, well, what's he changing? But just to be doing it, he's, it's the case is he's doing it. And I think uh, uh, you would agree that when you live your passion which we've all got it's that doing that 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 is the solution you know all this conspiracy stuff that's out there it's all great for waking people up but there's never a solution to it the solution is you by going out there and and, and doing something that you're passionate about and, and wanting to make it be a benefit for others and yourself maybe yourself first as well a community does exist mm. where everyone does what they love doing and, you know, the baker bakes because he loves baking and the guy that makes clothes makes clothes because he loves making clothes. And then the community just has what they need. But that community is not here. It's that's somewhere else in another world. Can that happen here? I doubt it because there are too many people that would sit around and say, I want clothes. I'm hungry. I need sex. I need uh, something to drink, but I don't want to work for it. I'll sit here and think of a song uh, that I'm just thinking about writing. Um, but I haven't written a song in a long time, but I'm thinking about one. But I still want to eat and I still want to live in as nice a house as yours. See, that system doesn't work. Doesn't work. Got to get off the porch. Got to do something. 20% of the people do 80% of the work, which means 80% of the people are sitting around in bureaucracies doing nothing. Now, the concept is correct, where people say, look, I want, a, I want a $15 an hour minimum wage, and I want free education and free health care. The concept is correct. We need to stop thinking about a system of value like we have. But the principle is everybody has to do something in that community in order to make it work. And it has just never worked in humanity. Never worked. Every Every nation that's tried it has completely failed. And you know what they say when they fail? Well, we just weren't doing it enough. If we did it more, we would have succeeded. But no, they won't succeed. The system we have for economics is about as good as it gets. As long as people don't hoard all the profit off the top and stop investing back into the process. And that is what I'm afraid has happened in the last 50 years. People have been scooping the profit off the top and hoarding it, but, keeping it in, in accounts and not putting it back into the system. Well, uh, yes, yes. Uh, but we can get off the porch and try something, though, can't we? Uh, and, run, yeah, and run with what we feel is the right thing to try to do. I was in Manhattan on, on Thursday night, and uh, it was terrible. <laughs> it was the worst traffic I've ever seen in my life. Plus, there were thousands of protesters downtown and all those police. A bunch of people got arrested, and I'm surprised the whole place didn't erupt in a riot. I'm glad my car didn't get a scratch on it, but it took four hours to get through this mess in midtown Manhattan. And uh, none of these people do anything. They're just there trying to tear down the system. They're not trying to build anything. They're just trying to tear down. And that's unfortunately where a lot of the energy is now in our political process. And it seems to be that way in lots of countries around the world. Okay. Now, people can catch you. Uh, you, you do a radio show still? Yes. Every Sunday evening, 8 p.m. Eastern, uh, X Squared Radio. Been on. That's my 12th year. Excellent. And uh, we talk about the mysteries of the universe and of the earth. And it's not called the Brooks Agnew Show. I couldn't do that. It's just uh, called X Squared Radio. So tune in and get squared. You're such a fascinating person. You really are. And, and is, is that the only website that you've got? 
No, I have uh, 11 other websites right. that have to do with various businesses that I own. Uh, I'm a CEO of an electric truck company. Uh, I have uh, uh, seven titles in print, soon to be eight. Uh, I have some films that I've worked on. Just things like that. Okay, but that would be the best website to put up on the screen, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's, that's, that's brain central. Literally <laughs> everything. What would you say, then, is your most important message to the audience? Well, the most important message is, yes, everything comes from source. But remember, you are source. One of the greatest lies of humanity is that somehow you were disconnected from God. And you have to go through someone else or something else to get there. That's just not true. You're very connected to him or her, whatever you feel. Yeah. And you've never been disconnected. And you are perfect just the way you are. That is a brilliant ending. Brooke, Agnes, thank you so, so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Well, we've come to an end on tonight's show. Don't forget that you can listen and watch all our past interviews on the More Show's official YouTube channel. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new daily shows. You may also find out more information on past and upcoming guests on the show via themoreshow.co.uk and do like us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates. So until next time, be safe.